Good afternoon. And like to introduce the newest addition to the dais, Mr. Alex Scott. Welcome. Placing Mr. Garrett Jones, who's gone back to park, so he will be missed, but we will be gentle on you today. No, and thank we, you. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Well, some of us will be gentle on you today. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Mrs. Scott. If I could call the roll first. Oh, call the roll, Ms. Fister. <laughs> Council President Wilkerson. Present. Council Member Sapone. Here. Council Member Cathcart. Present. Council Member Bingle. Here. Council Member Dillon. Here. Council Member Navarrete. Here. Let the record reflect that Council Member Klitsky is absent. I think she'll be joining us just a little later. <coughs> okay. All right, so uh, turning to the current agenda, I believe that um, we need a motion to suspend the rules um, under resolutions. Um, I move to suspend the rules. A second. It's For what purpose? Um, adding to the agenda or substitute <laughs> to fixing the problems with the item. Of uh, the resolution. resolution. To allow late sub sub substitution and to allow the item to stay on the agenda tonight for a vote. Can that be the motion? Well, um, that, that will be the motion. The motion is to approved. suspend the rules for the purposes. The motion is to suspend the rules for the purposes of adding Thank a you. late submission to the agenda. Correct. Move and second. All those in Not favor of suspending the rules. Oh. Did Does anyone want to speak on it or? Any, any reason, any yeah, reason to speak for, for everyone else who hasn't been following our council emails, um, this was inadvertently not circulated to all of council, but it was sent to the clerks and was added to the agenda and in the packet for the previous week. So it's already been there. It's been out. Nothing's changed beyond that. So at this point, we're mo moving to suspend the rules and then we can speak to the motion. So all those in favor of suspending the rules for this particular purpose indicate by saying aye. 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 Any no's? Aye. Abstentions? Okay. Now, let's speak to resolution 0096 <coughs> and the amendments. Do we need a formal motion to add it? Yes. Okay, so then I move to add it to the agenda. Second. It's been moved a second to add it to the agenda. Yeah, quickly, are we adding it to the agenda or suspending it just so our language is proper? Are we I adding was, or uh, initially suggested a single motion to suspend the rules and allow it to stay on the agenda because it actually appeared on the agenda uh, last week. So um, we're in kind of a little bit of uncharted territory, but if you want separate motions to suspend and add it, that's fine. Um, um, we no. get to the same place, right? Yeah, we yeah. get to the same sure. place. Okay. Well, we've already voted to suspend, so we might as well go ahead and vote to add at this point yeah. in time. Yeah, I don't have a problem with doing that. I just the want to make sure our... Yeah, the motion's to add resolution sure. 2024 0096 to the agenda, officially. And there, and there was a second? Was there a second to add? Yeah, second. It was moved and second to add. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any no's? Aye. Abstentions? Okay, that is added. To the agenda, you want. We now have Councilman Cathcart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Council President, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the Cathcart Amendment. Second. Um, if I could speak to it real yes, quick. Please do. So all this does is strikes one whereas, uh, and this is a whereas in here um, re regarding the uh, North South Corridor. Um, this has been slightly tweaked in this version from the original. Instead of would, it's now could. But the problem is there is absolutely zero nexus between the North-South Freeway and the Climate Commitment Act. In fact, the North-South Freeway was funded through a 2015 bipartisan, in fact, Eastern Washington-led effort to uh, get a gas tax package that was approved by, uh, by the legislature. And in doing so, they agreed to fully fund the North-South Freeway. That was part of the agreement. Um, at the time, uh, I think the Majority Coalition Caucus was in charge, and so it really came down to Eastern Washington legislators having the courage to take a pretty big vote on, on an issue like this. And so I get pretty offended when I hear even the intimation that somehow there is a connection between the two, because there is not. And I think it's, it's well, I, I, I think it's entirely unethical, frankly, to state that it would, 
because the fact of the matter is that the Climate Commitment Act, you can go online, and in fact, we have information from our own lobbyists that verifies that there is not one penny of Climate Commitment Act money um, or Go Forward Washington money that is a part of this package. It was passed in 2015 in a very previous package. And if we start to set a precedent of allowing these massive agreements that take courage from our elected officials uh, to essentially be overridden because of politics, I don't think that's the right thing to do. Uh, the North-South Freeway is funded. It is funded. The only way it becomes unfunded is if a bad faith legislature decides to take money away from what is already funded to fund most likely a pet project on the west side. Now, that's their prerogative, but for us to put this in this document that this could happen is incredibly misleading to the voters. And I think that it is frankly offensive to those who were in the legislature at the time fighting on our behalf to complete the North-South Freeway. We do not want to put future projects like this at risk because why would you take a bold vote if the legislature is just gonna erase what you did? So this is important. I think this has a huge, huge level of importance. And I would just strongly encourage this council to consider removing this line. It's a single whereas. It adds very little to anything to this measure, but I think it is so incredibly false that it does not belong in this document. Yeah, I just speak to that. The language does say it could, and that is what we're hearing on the ground, that if this ballot initiative were to pass, <laughs> that it would lead to a 30% reduction in the transportation budget. It does not say that it would, and I think that was correctly pointed out, but there are a lot of competing interests in the legislature, and just like if the city were to experience a 30% decrease in our city budget, um, a lot of things would be on the chopping block block for potential delay or pushed out. And so this is just communicating what we have heard from uh, folks is that this is one of those that could potentially uh, be delayed. Council Member Bingle. Yeah, and I guess I would speak to our state legislators and ask them to continue to fight for that funding regardless of the uh, outcome of 2117 because uh, this has been, again, a, a largely bipartisan effort to fund this program. You know, Senators Billig and then Baumgartner and, um, you know, and many uh, across the aisle have been fighting for this because it's been a priority for the city of Spokane. And so I actually think it's, it's offensive not to the current legislature, uh, but to the current legislature and legislatures in the past who did really come together to fight for an issue that was good for the city of Spokane. Um, and to me, uh, you know, we were told last year by all of our state partners that the North-South Corridor was fully funded. I mean, that we did a whole press release on it. There was a whole big... Uh, you know, thing. There's a press conference. Hey, it's fully funded. We're going to get it done. And as a matter of fact, you know, uh, Governor Inslee tried to take some money away, but we fought him and we beat that back. And it's not going to be moved back at all. As a matter of fact, we might move it up. You know, and it was a, a great, again, bipartisan effort from our state uh, legislators in the area to to make sure that the the state understood that. Um, you know, this was a priority for us. And so to me now to put it in here kind of feels um, like, it's a, like it's extortion in a certain way where it's like, well, we told you it was fully funded, but now if you don't vote for this, now we might take it away, uh, which again, I think Council Member Cathcart properly stated that if that's going to be the case, it puts a lot of future projects um, in jeopardy because why would we trust you when you say, oh, this is going to fully fund this project, but we know in the future you might actually use it um, as a way to uh, to pass legislation that you really want. So I, I, again, think it's not only offensive to the legislators who've worked tirelessly to make sure that we had funding there. I think it's offensive to the voters, and I think it's uh, it's despicable. Been Go ahead. I don't, I don't think it's offensive and, and despicable, but it is one whereas. So, I mean, whatever we want to do. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to speak to, um, yes, with a budget and potentially a deficit significantly at the state level, there is a potential, no matter how well-meaning and adamant electors work when they made that statement. Also, with the election this year, there will be a significant number of new electors in the legislature. So the very people who may have been our champions at that time, there is no guarantee that those same champions will be there or there will be a different climate around the north-south quarter or our representation at the state level. 
So I know it's only a one sentence, whereas, but it says could, could. That's the, that's the one word that we're hung up on, could. So I will not be supporting the amendment. Go ahead, Councilman. Yeah, Swan. I won't support the amendment either. And I think um, it is important for voters to know that how they're voting could have an impact on the north-south corridor. Um, and that impact is potentially real. And we're hearing that right now from legislators. Um, it is you know, a priority. We already saw last legislative session that it was a fight to keep it. And I 100% believe every single one of our representatives in this area will fight for it. But that doesn't mean that when reality comes and there's a 30% cut to the transportation budget that they won't be um, in a minority on votes because I believe that the legislator will continue to have priorities that are funded by the CCA of bike and pedestrian infrastructure. So I think voters need to know uh, their priorities, or not their priorities, but the potential impact. All right, Councilor Bingo, I'm sorry. I yeah. think that's the exact point we were making on the 10 year sunset on the sales tax measure, which is we're going to have a new legislature, city legislature, at the time that the 10 years comes. Kind of feels like we're making that point that uh, everybody here refuted when we said in 10 years, none of us are going to be here. It's going to be a completely different group making decisions. Is this a point funding. of order? I don't think that's relevant to this issue that we're voting on right now. It's 100% relevant to what we're saying. Council President just made a point. I am saying how we, we absolutely uh, opposed that same idea, not, not but, you know, two weeks ago. And it is relevant, as you're saying, to we need to tell the voters exactly what they're voting on. I mean, I feel like it's totally relevant. How is it not? I think, th if I may, I think the relevancy we will see 10 years. I don't know about 10 years, but I know the impact this will make in November, the outcome of this uh, 2117. And with the elections, we will know immediately. So I, I don't have a crystal ball for 10 years down the road, but in the next 60 days, well, 10, next 10 days, we will know the landscape um, of our funding and our representatives and potentially what the landscape will look like. So that's my position on that. Councilman Bingo? Yeah, and that's exactly my point, is that the, the point that's being made about this, if we don't support this, then future legislators, despite what was agreed to in previous legislatures, right, Future legislatures might decide, ah, you know what, we actually weren't the ones who made that promise and we're going to remove that. That is the exact argument against why the, the sunset for the sales tax measure is a fake sunset. Because, again, in the future, people, we will not be here. And people are going to be making, separate people are going to be making that decision exactly the way you're saying here. I'm saying I think it's a bad argument here because it is against the argument that was made about, about uh, the sales tax measure. Thank you for that. Any other council commentary? So at this point, any other comment before we vote on the amendment? Did you want to speak, Councilman Klitschke? Or just pulling your mic down? Okay. So before us is the cat cart amendment. As presented, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Noes? No. 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 The amendment fails. All right, so moving on to uh, resolution 2024-0100. I believe we have a proposed amendment there. Council President. I would yeah. make a, a motion to adopt the Cathcart Amendment on 0100. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second to any commentary on that amendment? And I will, I'll, I'll just read it real quick here. Um, so essentially what this does is it adds one recital and also a, a essentially an addendum to the centers and corridor study, so it doesn't change any language actually in the, the study itself. Uh, but all it says is, <clears throat> excuse me, one, uh, or it says the city council recognizes that the city's comprehensive plan should prioritize flexibility in centers and corridors by one, seeking policies that encourage a range of development approaches citywide, two, considers alternative approaches for centers and corridors that fall within the boundaries of public development authorities, business improvement districts, and acknowledges the importance of recognizing the unique and special needs and circumstances within those areas, and three, expresses a strong desire to explore 
increasing opportunities for neighborhood serving commercial businesses outside of designated centers and corridors, so neighborhood retail, in other words. Um, and so this essentially, because it's a study, it's broad, it's, it's, this is just to help provide a little bit more direction in the way forward as they put the code and the comp plan language together uh, to just consider, again, this kind of a little bit more of a flexibility um, in the approach. Any other commentary? I'll just make a comment that uh, several uh, citizens reached out to the plan commission conclude that the center and core study update the center and corridor update study is consistent with the goals and purpose of the Growth Management Act. So with that, and the concern is with the flexibility you're speaking to, Councilman McCatcart. Council President, if possible, could Spencer come down and speak to this, please, as he helped me to draft it? Your timing is impeccable. <laughs> Must have been watching. Yeah. <laughs> I was watching from the comfort of my desk. Yeah. Sorry, I lost my voice over the weekend, so hopefully you can hear me. Yeah. Um, the, I, I did have a discussion with Councilmember Cathcart. Uh, from the planning side, we don't see really any issues with the language that's there. We feel like there's, it's consistent with a lot of the, of the work that went into the plan and the policy guidance, so it wouldn't really uh, change things significantly. I think it just highlights some issues that Councilmember Cathcart's concerned about and wanted to make sure were highlighted. Councilmember Bingo? And, and I would say there was other actions that we've taken with, you know, parking and zoning and things that were not consistent, or not consistent, but separate from uh, what the Planning Commission would have recommended to us, and we went ahead with those anyway. And I think they've been beneficial to the city, um, and so I don't see this as being something that would be inconsistent or not of benefit to the city. Councilmember Klitschke, then Councilmember Kekar. There are parts of this amendment that I'm kind of agnostic about, um, not super passionate about the floor area ratio stuff, but um, being able to subdivide to qualify seems like a good idea to me because the land gets reserved for other development. Um, and then um, neighborhood retail, I would love to see more of. So that's kind of, <laughs> I'm a sucker for that one. So I'll be supporting this because I'm a big sucker for that one. <laughs> Councilman McCackhart, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say again, I mean, this is sort of just broad direction that doesn't really get into any sort of specifics, and we're still going to have to adopt the actual comp plan language and, and any code changes and, and whatnot as they come, come to us. So it's just directional. It's really not hyper-specific. Councilman Rizapone. Yeah, I generally agree with a lot of these principles, too. I, I just wish it had been talked about beforehand before coming to this point, because I in reading it wasn't exactly sure until you explained it right now. So okay. in the future, it would be helpful to hear kind of something that's a yeah. little bit more of substance. That's a change that's not super clear to make it clear before talking about it here. So you, like a synopsis yeah. of, of the, right. the change? Yeah. Or a conversation too. I'll go to Spencer and then I'll go to Councilmember Bingo. I'll, I'll just address that. Um, I wasn't able to meet with Councilmember Cathcart until a little bit later in the process. So I think to the extent that those were late, that's probably on us not um, providing the information as quickly as we sometimes can. So, Yeah, I would say at the same time when we suspend the rules and add an ordinance and pass it in the same day, I feel like we should be given that same courtesy if that's going to be our standard. Totally love that standard. If we're going to be shopping things early and letting people, other council members, see legislation before it's passed, I think that's a great idea, and I think we should all do it. Councilmember Dillon. Yeah, did um, anything kind of related to this amendment come up in the Planning Commission discussions with sort of shaping the, the study? Were there some conversations kind of floating around these concepts and bringing them into this? Uh, that's a good question. I would say yes. Um, the topics that are addressed by Cathcart's amendment are very similar to the conversations that Planning Commission had. As I noted earlier, I don't think there's anything that is in the amendments that isn't already addressed in the plan somewhere. It's, I would say, largely consistent with what, um, and it's not even a plan, it's a study. Um, so again, sort of setting broad direction, and I think the desire was really just to highlight those items as uh, of particular importance to the council. Any other commentary? All right, there's a motion on the floor to adopt the cat cart proposed amendments. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 No? Aye. Abstention? I pass 7 0. Thank you. All right. 
Okay. We're on, on to advanced. advanced. Yeah. On to advanced. All right, and uh, I don't believe there are border commission matters to deal with. So um, on to the consent agenda. Items one and two briefed by Rick Giddings. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Uh, good afternoon, City Council. Um, item one, A and B, these are both uh, equipment purchases, purchases from Pape Machinery of Spokane uh, for the waste energy facility using a source well contract. Item A is a John Deere uh, 316GR skid steer loader that will replace an older uh, unit in need of some costly repairs. Total cost for this, $64,234.67, including tax. Item B is a John Deere 85P excavator with waste grapple and thumb attachment. Uh, this will replace a rental unit that the department has been testing for the last several months. Uh, total cost for this, including tax, is $171,671.04. Any questions on either or one of those? Yes. What, what's a thumb? Sorry, I just... So if you imagine the bucket on a, on a backhoe, there's a little thumb that just so that if you are picking up something, it just oh. it gives you some gripping power. Okay. Yeah. Other questions on that? Uh, item two is a, a yearly contract renewal. This is the first of four with Clean Energy Corporation uh, for the maintenance and repair of our solid waste collection uh, CNG fueling site. Uh, we are charged a flat fee for the gallon equivalents that are uh, dispensed from that site, uh, but the count contract is not to exceed $250,000 per year. Any questions on that one? All right, thank you much. Thanks, Rick. Uh, items three through nine will be briefed by David Payne, who I believe is on the screen. Good afternoon, Council, Council, Council Members, Council President. The first is a five-year value blanket with Oxark of Spokane for the as need purchase of hydrochloric acid for use at the Waste Energy Facility from January 1st, 2025 to December 31st, 2029, not to exceed $625,000 plus tax with an annual spend of approximately $125,000. The next is a value blanket renewal 204 with Helfrich Brothers Boiler Works of Lawrence, Massachusetts for the purchase of superheater tube panels for use at the waste energy facility from December 15th, 2024 to December 14th, 2025, not to exceed $3,750,000 plus tax. The next item is Value Blanket Renewal 4 of 4 with Wemco, Inc. of Spokane, Washington for the as-need purchase of mechanical OEM parts for the refuse crane systems at the Waste Energy Facility. This contract runs from December 1st, 2024 to November 30th, 2025, not to exceed $160,000 plus tax. The next item is a contract renewal 3 of 4 with Knight Construction and Supply of Deer Park, Washington for mechanical repairs at the Waste Energy Facility from November 1st, 2024 to October 31st, 2025, not to exceed $2,200,000 plus tax. The next two items, contracts for transportation of topsoil to the north side landfill from, for the Solid Waste Disposal Department from November 15th, 2024 to November 14th, 2025, with contracts being awarded to Action Materials of Spokane, not to exceed $65,000 plus tax and Circle M Construction and Landscaping Supplies of Spokane Valley, Washington, not to exceed $65,000 plus tax. The total spend council between the two of these will be $65,000. The next item is a public works agreement with Industrial Services, Industrial Service Solutions, AKA Bay Valve of Longview, Washington for on-site valve repair services at the Waste Energy Facility from January 1st, 2025 to December 31st, 2025 not to exceed $150,000 plus tax. The next two items, five-year pre preventive maintenance agreements with Wemco Inc. of Spokane, Washington for the Waste Energy Facility from January 1st, 2025 to December 31st, 2029. The first is for crane, hoist, trolley, and lifeline preventive maintenance and inspections, not to exceed $430,000 plus tax or an annual spend of $86,000. The second is bridge crane maintenance and inspections not to exceed $370,000 plus tax or a $74,000 annual spend. The last item I have for you today, purchase from Titan Truck Equipment of Spokane Valley for two, nope, that's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think you're done. I'm Dave. done. I, I do have a question for him. Go ahead, Councilor yes. Bingo. 
Um, so on any of our contracts with the waste to energy facility that go out to 2029 or beyond, um, anything like that, do we, what is our exit clause in, um, on those contracts? Because if the Climate Commitment Act were to remain in place, there's no carve out for the waste to energy facility and we have to shut it down, what do we do? All the contracts have a clause in there that say the city may break, break the contract at any time. And no financial penalty to the no city? Fi no financial penalty. Thank you. It's, it's not a guaranteed income for the contractors. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, items 10 through 12 will be briefed by Lauren Searle. Good afternoon, Council. Item number 10 is purchased with Titan Truck for two uh, service truck uh, bodies. Uh, these are just the back half of the truck uh, be built by our, weld our welding shop. Um, total value is $121,000. $693. Item number 11 is purchased from Core and Main for uh, miscellaneous waterworks projects. This is uh, parts to do tie-ins on the West Plains booster station. Uh, we're pre-purchasing those to be ahead of the contract. Total dollar value is $177,300. Item number 12 is a contract with KN Electric to replace the trash rake at the Powerhouse 2 out at uh, Upriver Dam. Um, the old failing trash rake, uh, replacing this one is total value of $1,246,438. Any questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, real quick, Lauren, before you go, uh, while you're here, could we just also jump to resolution 2024-0105? I can do that. So you can uh, get it all done in one fell swoop. That, this resolution is an update of the public rule uh, for water miscellaneous water fees, most of those being tap meter fees, new hydrant install fees, uh, those costs that we charge throughout the year for different developments. Um, throughout the uh, list of updated prices, most of them are about a 1% to 2% increase. Uh, there are some that are a larger increase and some that are a larger decrease. Uh, most of that's based off of the available parts that we get and uh, current value blanking pricing for those parts. Any questions? Right. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, back to consent. Items 13 and 14. Clint Harris. Good afternoon, Council President and Council. The Street Department seeking approval for 13A to purchase road salt at a cost of uh, not to exceed $140,000 from salt distributors. And then for 13B, the uh, Street Department's also seeking approval for a value blanket to buy ice kicker, which is another form of salt, uh, at a cost not to exceed 115000 annually. Clint. Hey, Clint. What's the... What's the difference between the two? Uh, the uh, normal road salt is, is just that. It's normal salt. The uh, ice kicker is a magnesium-infused salt, so it's a little hotter. We use it in, uh, when the temperatures get down a little bit colder. I was going to say, we know when winter has arrived when we start seeing uh, requests for salt. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, for item number 14, the street department seeking approval for the uh, contract for the asbestos abatement cleanup that's already taken place and happened up on Austin Road at, at a cost not to exceed $80,476. $80, Questions? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, item 15 will be briefed by Lyndon Smithson. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is a contract amendment for an outside council contract that we have for one of our officer involved shootings, the Bradley matter, where we've been sued by uh, the city of Spokane was sued. This will increase the contract by $150,000 to a total of $400,000. We're in the discovery phase right now, so we're preparing our defenses. We have a mediation set in December so that if, uh, if that were successful, then the case would be resolved at that time. I'm not, I don't know if that will happen, but if we do have to go to trial, I anticipate that we would almost double the total amount that we have right now. Okay. 
Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Lyndon. Item number 16 will be briefed by Colin Quinhurst. Good afternoon. This is a contract amendment with Kittleson Associates to continue their work designing infrastructure projects for the West Central neighborhood uh, using funding uh, from the West Quadrant Tax Increment Finance District and ARPA funds for an additional $299,677. Thank you. Item 17, Doug Greenland. Good afternoon, Council President, Council Members. Uh, item 17 is an amendment to a consultant agreement with McMillan Incorporated of Boise, Idaho for construction management and engineering support services for the Upper River Dam through December 31st of 2025 for an additional $123,588. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Items 18 and 19 will be briefed by Chris Averett. Good afternoon, Council Members. Today I'm seeking approval for an amendment and extension of the interlocal agreement between the City of Spokane and Spokane County for disposal waste services at the Waste Energy Facility. Uh, this amendment includes the addition of five one-year extensions and the modification for the county to pursue their own bypass disposal agreement if they elect to do so. Uh, as a refresher, bypass waste is waste that exceeds processing capacity of the waste energy and is shipped directly from the transfer stations to a landfill. Uh, this agreement provides approximately $8 million in revenue annually. Yes. Is there an increase of that, like an increase in revenue from years past, or is it? The same as what we've taken in years before. Uh, yeah, it's um, so. Last year we had kind of an inflationary true up, um, so there was a 12 percent increase in the disposal cost. This year's uh, reverts back to a CPI index formula that's based off of the October CPI index. So I can't say exactly what it is yet, but cool. Uh, if there's no more questions than that, the second item is an amendment with waste management for the transportation and disposal of bypass waste from the county transfer stations. Uh, the county has taken over self-operations of the facility and wishes to have waste management hauled directly from the transfer stations instead of using their current third-party hauler. Uh, this additional hauling increases the cost per ton by $4.87 per ton, or roughly $300,000 a year, which is solely covered by the county. Thank you. Thanks. Items 20 through 23 will be briefed by Dan Buller. Good afternoon. Item 20 is a proposed low bid contract with Apollo of Kennewick, Washington for the Plains Booster Station, um, which involves the construction of an additional booster station adjacent to the existing 40-year-old booster station and will supply the growing West Plains. The low bid was $4.698 million. Dollars um, plus tax, to which we propose to set aside a 10% administrative reserve. Five other bids were received, which is a good sign. The low bid was about 357000 or 7% below the engineer's estimate. Work is expected to begin in the spring and likely won't be completed until summer of 2026. Um, item 21 is the proposed addition of 90000 to the administrative reserve for the 2023 residential chip seal project. The, addition, the amount of crack seal and pavement repair quantity that we include in the bid documents is an average based on prior year, and this year's project required more than is typical um, for those two items. Um, item 22 is a proposed addition of 500000 to the administrative reserve for the Washington Stevens Bridge project, as they described in PIES last week, as the existing surfacing was being removed in preparation of treatment for the new surfacing poor quality concrete was discovered and had to be removed, including concrete below the difficult to access mat of rebar. And then finally, item 23 is a proposed addition of $800,000 to the on-call contract for parametrics for construction management. We use parametrics to do construction management, including inspection for projects when we lack sufficient personnel to provide those services. Funds paid to parametrics are reimbursed from the project on which parametrics is working. Thanks, Dan. Uh, items 24, 25, 26, and 27 will be briefed by Dave Steele. 
Good afternoon, Council President, Council Members. Um, item number 24 and 25 are both um, amendments to the master contracts we have with ATS for HVAC controls and parts and installation labor. Um, these are to increase the overall spending authority to allow us to scoop up Fire Station 1 to roll that system over to the new system of uh, the Compass server um, and do the installation of all the uh, new controls. Um, so the first one is $160,000 worth of additional parts. Um, these are ARPA dollars, so we're trying to get those things in covered as quickly as possible. Um, and the, the labor portion is $329,000 of additional labor on that section of the contract. This is very similar to what we did for the MLK Center, um, and it continues the process of rolling all of our systems over to a central server, like City Hall is currently on this. We now have the intermodal facility we've completed. Um, MLK is at about 50% plus or minus, and then this one will be right behind that one, actually right behind the West Central Community Center, which is on tap next. So. Any questions there? Yes, sir. Yeah, just what's kind of the timeline for the completion of the project and for them to be fully fully updated on the HVAC? Uh, the fire station? Mm -hmm. um, we are aiming for kicking off because what they'll have to do is they, once we get the authority, they order parts. We're probably looking at a January 1 start date for them to start installing. They'll be done within 60 days after that, give or take. So unless they fall into something that they weren't expecting, so. It moves pretty quick once we get the parts in, so. All right, number 26 is the an agreement with Bosco Construction. This is for the demolition and reconstruction of the water feature over at the West Central Community Center. Um, that is kind of a, a <coughs> I don't know, it's, it's like a community fountain that's been there. It was built by donation a long time ago. That was one of their projects that they identified as an ARPA um, a spend. Um, it, it's something that's very important to them as a community center. Uh, so this replaces that entire structure, which is built originally out of cedar. Um, we've got a composite going back in there that'll give them a very, very similar look, but a, a much better longevity and, and, and better durability. So. Uh, then the final one is in, in agreement with Colvico to do, uh, this is early electrical site work over at the water department. Again, uh, we brought a contract to you probably two weeks ago about windows. It was longer than that ago, probably six weeks ago about windows. Early work on windows for the preparation of the renovation of the meter shop. This is the similar thing. We're, we're putting in new transformers, uh, running new power, those kind of things, just to get that early work done so that when we come before you with a contract for the actual renovation, we've already knocked out two of the pieces, so. All right, thank you. So moving on to legislative agenda, I believe uh, Council Member Cathcart has ordinance C36570. Uh, yeah, and this has been briefed uh, previously as well. Uh, effectively, it just sets some uh, guardrails and, and process around the siting of, of these kind of uh, facilities that are a little bit more challenged, such as homeless facilities or harm reduction type facilities, that sort of thing. Um, that's the uh, essentially the effect of the ordinance. Yeah, I'll move to defer this until after the roundtable discussions. Um, I brought up some reasonings to Councilmember Cathcart. Uh, I'll say that I do so um, somewhat begrudgingly, <laughs> but knowing the community interest in these items, um, the different policies that we've um, brought forth as part of the discussion, you know, selfishly, um, and I mentioned this before in, in one of the other um, deferred items, the, uh, I guess you'd call it ban the address or looking at the um, employment component. Um, that was on the original uh, discussion around uh, homeless protections. Moving that forward, that's also part of that uh, kind of deferral package. Um, and I know that this ordinance uh, is is part of the the um, upcoming feedback sessions. Um, I do think this Im ordinance is important. Um, you know, we've heard very loud and clear. Um, for more transparency. And I think that um, when you look at uh, a lot of the discussion around um, the need for more community engagement around how we site facilities, um, there's definitely a, a way to um, have this ordinance specifically address that issue. 
Um, so I'll leave it up to, to the group to decide, but that's kind of where I'm at on this. Second. Second. Yeah, I, I guess what, what does after mean? So there's the December town hall that kind of goes over the litany of different ordinances. What was that, December 6, I think I saw? Or no, Nicolette's shaking her head. I, I feel like we should just have Nicolette give us a, st like a progress update if we have time. Can she just give, like, tell us where we're at? And I think she can give us the timeline. I'd probably okay. like to bring that back to another session, okay. Councilman McCluskey. Uh, as she's giving the dates on the last town hall meeting is scheduled for, what's that date, Nicolette? The 10th of December? December 10th. Okay. Yeah. I, I will speak to the deferral. I was at the last uh, town hall roundtable with providers and businesses, and we could not get consensus. It was all over the place on what's the amount of money that if the city's contributing, um, what size of the facility, uh, the types of facilities, questions kept coming up over and over again. Uh, really, what's the last reiteration of the good neighbor agreement? So the nucleus is there, but for us to get to some type of compromise that we can all agree on, I think we are still struggling through that. But kudos to all those who have been continuing to come to those meetings. And there's been a dedicated group of about 35, 40 who've come to every meeting to give their input on this. And so for that reason, I'm going to support the deferral because I think we are working through getting to consensus on the questions that have been asked of Councilmember Catcart. <laughs> Councilmember Catcart, yes. Yeah, I, uh, of course, I don't, I don't support the deferral. I would prefer a little bit more of a date certain for sure either way. But, um, and so I hope we can target a specific date for this. But I, I've sort of seen the writing on the wall. I've, I've assumed that this was going to be the case. Uh, so I won't belabor this too much because I think we know where it's going. Uh, I will just say I don't agree with this process overall of deferring important, uh, at times very public safety oriented uh, ordinances until someday future. I think there is a crisis right now. I think there is a huge number in our community right now who are very concerned about these things. And I think it just, it makes this entire body look bad when we just continue to defer, defer, defer and refuse to take bold action. And so I would just say, I hope that at the end of this, I hope I am pleasantly surprised that at the very end of this entire process, there is actually bold action that is taken. Um, and I guess that will just remain to be seen. Yeah, I'll just remind everyone in the public and council members, uh, Nicolette just sent out the last press release, but the next town hall is scheduled for Thursday, November 7th, because Tuesday is election day. That'll be discussing lawful and unlawful camping. And then Tuesday, the 19th, pedestrian interference in Sintonlai, and then uh, December 10th, a summary of the round tables and a town hall type receiving of information rather than round tables. And then it would be coming back to committee with a proposal. I'm going to Councilmember Navarrete, and then I'll come to Councilmember Klitschke. Thank you. Um, I am in full support uh, to defer this as well. Um, I do recall when the original and initial um, ordinance um, that came out from the Human Rights Commission that I carried on, I do recall um, Councilmember Cathcart uh, mentioned that it, it, you know, we had to be, as a council, uh, transparent with the community. Um, therefore, the Roundtables were created. Uh, we are being transparent. We are trying to involve the community, as we also heard um, <coughs> during that night of the meeting. So um, we also, I think most of us did agree to bring any concerns about houselessness uh, as a whole package to listen to everyone. Um, we are all concerned about the community safety. It's not just some of us, it's all of us. So by hearing the community, we are acknowledging that we wanna get involved, bring solutions to the table and proceed on um, as a council. Thank you, council member Klitschke. Yeah, I just wanted to also elaborate on the round tables. 
Just because you haven't been showing up, if you haven't been showing up, doesn't mean you shouldn't. Um, we provide surveys at every single event so that people's individual feedback as well as their group feedback at their tables gets recorded. And Nicolette's doing a great job trying to keep track of all of that. If you feel behind but you want to get involved, I would encourage you to reach out to her and she will capably and gladly get you up to speed on that so that you can participate and know where we're at and give her feedback. Councilmember Binkle? Yeah, I, I say I don't support the deferral either. You know, we've we've talked about this quite a bit. And um, this one actually recently came forward um, because of, uh, you know, CAP potentially being uh, cited in the Chief Gary neighborhood. Um, after, you know, I thought that there was pretty clear direction that we would not go there. Um, and so I don't support the deferral because, again, I think it is uh, a, a community asking for its voice to be heard, uh, not saying that facilities can't be cited, but let's have more public engagement and, um, um, and public feedback before we do that. I don't see how this is uh, opposed uh, to anything that we've said we want to do. Um, but, um, again, this is, to me, this is, again, uh, yeah, I th if it's going to fail, just let it fail. You know, just vote against it. There's a motion on the floor, so moving the second. Yes. What is that motion? To date uncertain? It was. Well, I defer to the mover, but my recollection is that it was to a date after the town halls were completed. Right. Do we want to put a date on that? <coughs> I, if I can speak to that, I think what we're going to do after the town halls is bring forward everything to a committee together. So that is the intent from the roundtable discussions. So it doesn't make sense to put this on the agenda as a standalone item. I think that was the original intent with referring it back to committees in the first place. <coughs> I'm sorry. Councilmember Catcart, then Councilmember Bingle. Yeah, I mean, I would just say hearing that, I, I would definitely say let's not defer just vote it down if there's zero intent for this to ever be considered again which is what i just heard then just vote it down and let the whatever the majority brings forward be be the vehicle because this is clearly dead so just vote it down <coughs> yeah and i would say again it doesn't make sense to whom right to us it makes sense to have a date certain but uh if the council majority it doesn't make sense and again if it's going to fail because you're going to bring forward your own package again let it die you know the the constant deferrals uh you know again do not paint us as a council in a good light because we can talk about whatever we want to do but the community sees this as again us not taking action on something and you can say we've got the round tables we've got all that this is an action that's being deferred on something and when you say it doesn't make sense again i think that that is a frustrating comment for me and council member cathcart to hear because to us, it makes total sense. Um, and so if it doesn't make sense, then it doesn't make sense to the council majority and not just that it doesn't make sense. I will speak to that. <clears throat> it's making sense to a lot of the people who are coming to the round tables because they are actually working through this process with us and really getting an understanding of what council can do and cannot do, uh, the scope of our abilities to impact some of the things the community is asking for. So by going through this, we are getting the feedback and we're also educating our community at the same time. So it makes sense to me to defer if we want to pick a specific date or to the date after the round table has been completed. But I think this is as transparent as we can get. Who knows? Uh, Councilmember Bingham, we might get to where you're at. But if you shoot it down now, who knows what that might be like. So I'm going to ask council members, don't just assume the outcome before we get there. A motion is second on the floor to defer until after the completion of the roundtables. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Noes? Aye. No. Abstentions, the ayes have it. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on to resolutions. Um, resolution 0101, I believe, is going to be briefed by Jackson, or, yeah? Um, I think just really quick, this was briefed last week at committee about Post Street Bridge. I think that's about it. All right. Uh, resolution 0102 will be briefed by Inga Note. Good afternoon, Council President and Council Members. 
Um, this is just making some adjustments to a couple of school zones, um, Sacagawea because they moved their crosswalk from 33rd to 32nd, and then um, adjustments to the boundaries on Perry, or Perry Street by uh, Yasuhara. So, any questions? Oh, all right, thank you. And uh, resolution 0103, uh, Spencer Gardner. Uh, no updates from the presentation I gave last week, so if there aren't any questions, this is the 27 by 27 proposed mobility network. Okay. Great. Uh, resolution 0104 will be briefed by Kyle Arrington, and then I will ask him while he's up to also look at ordinance C36602. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Good afternoon, Madam President, Council Members. So. <coughs> 0104 is a request to declare Whitney Equipment Company the sole source provider of flight equipment. Um, we're asking for a five-year value blanket for $500,000. This is for pumps, mixers, and associated maintenance parts. Councilman Bingle. Yeah, why are we making them a sole source? Because uh, it has to be like and kind, especially most of this is for parts, and so impellers on the pumps and things like that, they have it has to work together. And then when we look at replacing them, then it usually we replace the pumps, a new pump station, or a lot of these are in our lift stations too. Mm -hmm. So as we do those, are they the only distributor of the parts that we need? Uh, Whitney is yes. So they're the sole di the distributor of the flight products, okay. and the, we have flight pumps in a lot of them. Thank and you. one mixer at the plant, so that's all we have at the plant. Um, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. The ordinance C36602 is just an amending to Spokane Municipal Code 13.03. This is to add clarity and definitions to the Spokane Municipal Code around grease traps and grease control devices. No substantive changes really with that. So, great, thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, jumping past the one that Lauren already briefed, Ordinance C36575 will be briefed by Adam McDaniel. Is there any change to it? No, there's been one we've been entertaining Yeah, and this is the deconstruction ordinance that was previously briefed at Urban Experience back in September, and there's not been any changes. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, jumping to ordinance C36597, that will be briefed by Melissa Morrison. the ordinance for a change to the CHHS board uh, for the council members to be non-voting members? Great, thank you. Uh, and skipping past the other two hearing items, uh, ordinances 36600 and 36601 will be briefed by Abigail Martin. Good afternoon, Council President and Council Members. This is what I um, spoke to you all about at the PIES committee meeting last week. The first is regarding the transportation, the establishment of the Transportation Commission, taking in feedback for nomenclature regarding the Community Assembly's representative, uh, repealing of the CSAC board, which was still found on some of the code. Chris Wright found that, and then also incorporating feedback heard from the DSP. So making their amendments. That's for that Transportation Commission ordinance. For the second one, this is officially um, changing what has been referred to as the traffic calming fund and use of the automatic traffic safety cameras that we have and establishing the Spokane Safe Streets for All Fund. Um, and then use like permissible use and intent of what that fund is for. So really trying to hone in on definitions and proper delineation and expenditure. Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, could you just share a little bit of what the difference between the, the sort of definition of traffic calming in this ordinance versus how we've been treating it? 
I think there's a connotation and other council members who have worked on this closely too, please feel free to jump in in your experience as well, but I think there's a connotation between traffic as uh, specifically um, vehicular traffic. And I think the idea is to try to say that vehicles belong on the road and so do pedestrians and cyclists and buses. And so to try to just note that the road and the public right of way is for all users. That would be my simplest answer. Sure. Other thoughts? <clears throat> Councilmember Bingle, then Councilmember Zappone. Is it the Spokane Safe Streets for All Fund or just the Spokane Safe Streets Fund? I think there is an edit for For All. Okay. Yep, so Ms. Fister, I don't think that got captured in the title of the ordinance there on the, in the agenda, but it's in the body of the ordinance, not there on the title. Um, and just to Council Member um, Cathcart's point, um, I think there's just been confusion around what traffic calming is, and so this would define it in a more clear way for uh, both city employees, council members, and the community about what this fund is used for. Okay. I'll call Councilor yeah. Bingle. I guess I would just <clears throat> quickly say, you know, the, the way that this is funded, you know, with the uh, red light cameras and stuff, um, you know, that's a vehicular infraction that's going to happen, mm -hmm. and it, it feels as if it's if it's specifically vehicles that are paying it and not bikes and not pedestrians. Feels like those programs should be focused on slowing those, um, that part of traffic, not the others. Not to say that the others aren't important and that we can't fund those another way, but to me it doesn't feel like this is a, a proper use of it where we're penalizing folks and then building the infrastructure out for people not paying this penalty. Council Member Klitsky, then Council Member Cathcart. The reason that we slow vehicles in these areas is to make them safe for other modes. There's data out there that shows even going five miles per hour faster, it makes your, your whoever you hit 10% more likely to be a fatality. So that is why we slow the modes. We use the money for other kinds of safety measures in those areas because we're trying to make these roads safe for everyone, not just drivers. And most people that are out there using other modes also drive. So it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a virtuous cycle of trying to make the situation better while we also penalize bad behavior. Councilmember Bingle, or Councilman Cathcart, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll speak more to it when it comes up for a vote, but I mean, I think that just the broader definition of, of traffic calming um, which I don't think actually is traffic calming anymore. I think it's sort of just transportation at that point. I think it's just broader. Um, my, my biggest concern is we have a very finite amount of money coming into this program um, because of A, fixed costs, uh, because of uh, uh, funding uh, officers to, to do traffic enforcement, mm -hmm. and the ability for us to then get projects off the ground are very minimal, even if we do adaptive type projects, which there's a lot of conversation around, and, mm -hmm. and I think still we need a lot of process. But uh, regardless, there's just not a lot that we are going to be able to do today, like as it stands now, before this ordinance. And I just worry that once this is passed, we broaden that definition of traffic calming. Suddenly, your, your entire budget's just eaten up because of all the myriad of other kind of ways you can spend the money. And, uh, and so I, w I think you know, this has been around since about 08, 09. Uh, I, I think the public understands at least the, the intent behind these automated traffic cameras and what they're funding. And so I just, to me, it's a little worrisome. Uh, you start changing things like that. And I, I just wonder if we will continue to have the, the public buy-in on, on these sorts of things if they don't start, if they're not seeing that the investments are actually affecting them. Council members opponent. Yep. Um, I would just add that this ordinance would align us with the federal guidelines and paradigm on safe systems approach is the, the name of that. And I think there's a misconception that uh, that does not involve vehicles at all, but it, it does. So it involves safe, safer people, safer vehicles, safer roads, and safer speeds. And um, I've shared this uh, committee and um, through emails exchange too, but it includes things such as promoting safer speeds, through context-appropriate speed limits, road designs, and other practices. So there's uh, addressing vehicles, pedestrians, cyclists, and all modes of driving. So I think this aligns us well with the federal government and the state government, which also makes us more competitive for grants uh, and with this funding. 
and it um, aligns everyone in City Hall to be thinking through the safer systems approach rather than just thinking about traffic calming. Yeah, the Councilmember Keckhart. Yeah, last thing I just say. I mean, I, I, I can appreciate there's federal guidance on this, and, and there's federal guidance on a lot of things. But at the end of the day, we're the city of Spokane. We do things kind of the way you know we do them. And if there's some good ideas uh, that other jurisdictions or the federal government have, we can listen to those. But it really should be about what is best for the citizens that we represent at the core. And I think at the core, our citizens want traffic calming. And if we're unable to provide actual traffic calming, I just worry about the viability, uh, their trust in this body, their, tr you know, their ability to trust the decisions that we make. And so I just want to make sure that we're level setting, they under that we're understanding their needs and desires. And I'm not sure that we are taking that into account. Thanks for all of the feedback. I do think that the comfort for me in this ordinance is that there are like specific criteria that folks from other departments who are saying, can we use this to pay for traffic calming? You now have something where you can say, show me how that fits with the criteria. So I'm hopeful it'll serve us well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to hearings. Um, H1 will be Jackie Churchill, I believe. Good afternoon, Council President, Council Members. Uh, this is an ordinance amending the land use application procedures in accordance to Senate Bill 5290. I briefed you um, at Urban Experience on October 14th and last week as well, um, but I'm happy to take any additional questions if there are any. All right, thank you. And items H2 and H3 are Jessica Stratton. All right, H2 is a uh, hearing, uh, it's a best practice hearing for the public to comment on the citywide CIP. At the close of that hearing, there will be a vote on the citywide CIP ordinance. Hearing three is an RCW required hearing uh, to allow public to comment on possible revenue sources for the city. At that time, there will be a staff presentation then the hearing, and then at the close of the hearing, there will be a vote on the property tax levy. A lot of hearings. That concludes the advanced agenda. I will entertain a motion for approval. <coughs> so moved. Second. Been moved and second to approve the advanced agenda. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 No. Aye. No. No. The agenda is approved. We are in recess until 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>